Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. We're about to get it all started, my friends. How's everybody's happy welcoming you back from the weekend? How was your weekend? I trust that you had a wonderful weekend. I trust all is okay. Michael Rudnan, quick share, be back in 20. Okay, Michael, by then we should have started... Our improv, those are the guys that I brought on today. Bridge MCP, hey y'all. Uh, you know, Bridge, you're saying hey all. You know, in, in, in here in, in Texas, we say hey y'all. So I guess there's another Y that would be missing. And I know you are up where it's cold, very, very cold. But you know what? Uh, right here in Texas isn't all that warm right now either, but you know, for me, this is cool. For most Texans, however, I think this is all okay, y'all. This is all okay. This is all okay. I am trying to fire off one of my automated things here that runs the shares, and for some reason, it's not seeing the item. So I guess I better go ahead and do a manual share because... We, I think I need to do a manual share. I'm not sure about that because you know how these things run. Sometimes they run, sometimes they don't. Anyhow, we are going to have a great show for you today. Actually, it looks like it did its thing. We're going to have a great show for you today. And the title of the show today is going to be, if I can pull it up and put it on the screen, the title of the show today is, Can't Tell Us Nothing Improv Visits. And in that, in that one, I tell you, there is a story that one of the improv guys talks about his wife that I think you've just got to see. Uh, it's going to be a touching story. I hope you stick around for that. Those of, You know, we have a lot of people that come in and they stay 5, 10, 15 minutes and then they leave. Today I want you to stay as long as you can. That is what we need to do. So Trump is going to plan a TV farewell. Hope networks do not show it. If they show that fear well, then we know it's, well, we all know it's all about money, Breach. So, you know, you, you know that. It's all about money. Anyway, title of the show, Can't Tell Us Nothing, Improv Visits, Healthcare, Politics, Journalism, and More. The Improv Group, Can't Tell Us Nothing, Visits, and they are, there's a poignant healthcare story that we want you to hear. But before we get started with that, I want to play the message that President Obama sent or had over the weekend to the folks in Georgia, because Georgia is important and we have to try to win Georgia. If we want real progressive policies or somewhat progressive policies, that's going to help 99% of Americans. The other 1% really doesn't need our help, right? You know why. Anyhow, check it out. When you've got a couple of senators who are downplaying a pandemic, towing the line of a president who botches the response to the pandemic. At the same time, behind closed doors, they're calling their brokers? I, that's not public service. That alone should motivate, I hope, the people of Georgia to say, we want somebody in there who cares about us. Exactly, we want somebody in there who cares about us. So, Bridge, you got your T-shirts. Please, where is the picture, Bridge? Info at politicsdoneright.com or send it to me via Facebook or however you wish. You know, there are many ways that you can get it here. Send me that pic with you posing with that stuff, maybe in the snow. I don't know. Anyhow, yeah, we want to see our folks with, the, with, with our stuff on. That would be great. Anyhow, folks, uh, I also want to show you. You know, I, I, I wrote a little piece on Facebook, right? And this person just doesn't want to believe. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This person just doesn't want to believe that the person who won the election was Joe Biden. And I, I'll, I'm going to be frank with you. I don't know how you can live your life and believe anybody is going to take you seriously if you constantly preach things like, uh, you know, you'll see on November 20th that, that he really isn't elected that it's really not it's really not Biden that's going to be president and you keep have to be saying are these people playing with a right mind are they correct so I mean it turns out that I have people on my feed 
we have this, this long feed that's mostly driven by one person. Just talking about how uh, Donald, how Biden is not going to be the president. And you'll see, you'll see, this is what they're saying. You'll see what's going to happen. You'll see what's going to happen. And it's going to happen. It's, you, you just don't know what's going to And they keep saying that while the Supreme, the courts are kicking things out of the courts left and right, right? So this is my feed. This feed has to do with one person constantly saying, this, this is what this person says, uh, con just continuing the delusion on part. But anyhow, when the Republican Secretary of State comes out and says this, shouldn't we, shouldn't we really just call it in? Check it out. We have now counted legally cast ballots three times and the results remain unchanged. And the results remain unchanged. I know there are people that are convinced the election was fraught with problems, but the evidence, the actual evidence, the facts tell us a different story. We, what more do they want? The Republican Secretary of State of Georgia, whose state has counted the vote three different times, and each time we get the same results, and somehow all these people think something magical is going to happen. What, Republic, what the Republican Party is doing to its people, and I'm not blaming a lot of these people, including this woman here on my feed that continues to harass and talk about how we are going to see what's going to happen, etc. You have to, at some point, you have to realize that those people are, you know, they're really sick. They are ill. Nobody can be that way if they're not ill. And for that, we blame them. A Ali Velshi did a great piece over the weekend that I said, I've got to play it. Check it out. Ali Velshi hits the nail on the head. He excoriates the Republicans. He excoriates the president. And he talks about a special stench. Check this out and let's take it on the other side. One of the hallmarks of our democratic system is the commitment to the peaceful transition of power. That hallmark has been tested this last month, but at the heart of the peaceful transition of power is the notion that there is just one president at a time. And it's clear right now that we have one president. It's just that it's not the man in the White House. Donald Trump has given up. He stopped governing. In fact, the entire Trump administration and Republicans writ large seem to have given up. They're paralyzed by their dear leader who can't be bothered to do anything but whine and complain and lie about his increasingly obvious election loss. And their collective refusal to accept the results of a free and fair election is having dire consequences. It goes beyond the big picture damage to our democratic institutions, which should not be diminished. In the abdication of governance, there are actions lives at stake. State and local election officials, including a few rare Republicans, have begged the outgoing president to stop his election lies. Officials are actually facing death threats. Their relatives are facing death threats. But he hasn't stopped. Trump continues to lie. Consequences be damned. And he hasn't stopped because no one's really trying all that hard to stop him. Where are congressional Republicans? Where are Senate Republicans? Where are state and national Republicans? Some of them are brazenly standing behind Trump. A tiny few have spoken out about his antics, often because they are themselves uh, the brunt of his attacks. But most remain silent while coronavirus rips through this country and the president won't even say its name. Silence on the pandemic starts at the top. The outgoing president hasn't talked about the record daily new case numbers. He hasn't talked about the record daily new hospitalizations or on the right of the screen, the record new daily deaths. He often talks about coronavirus as a thing that doesn't result in death. Tell that to the two and a half thousand people dying a day this week. In fact, almost no Republicans have talked about this. And their silence is an admission of their guilt, an admission that their inaction with this president may be responsible for the deaths of Americans who believe Trump's lies and by extension, their lies about the virus, about it going away, about it not being all that contagious, about not needing masks. They supported a denier because they thought it was good politics or they didn't follow science or both. And people died. As of tonight, 
279,303 Americans have died from the coronavirus. How many lives could have been saved if Republicans stood up? How many lives could have been saved if Republicans stopped the lies? How many lives could have been saved if Republicans cared more about their constituents than about their reelection? Because this is not about their constituents. It's just about them and their power and their all-encompassing desire to keep that power. The man in the White House has said nothing about the new distressing job that just came out. A recovery is happening and it's helping some people immensely and others not at all. 700,000 Americans have been filing for unemployment insurance claims every week for 37 weeks. Plus, 20 million people are still on the pre-pandemic unemployment rolls. This is unheard of. So what does the man in the Oval Office do? He said nothing about that dire report. Congressional Republicans were almost uniformly silent on the jobs report. But it makes sense when you think about it. For months, Mitch McConnell has blocked relief to those in need. Relief that passed the House on October the 1st. And the man in the White House has said nothing about the need for relief in weeks. 13.4 million people are on pandemic unemployment programs that expire at the end of December. He doesn't care about that. He was never even part of negotiations to get another round of relief to Americans in need. He made a point of saying he wasn't going to participate. So why should we expect anything different? Unlike a real president, the man in the White House will let Mitch McConnell do whatever he wants. He doesn't care about negotiations. He doesn't seem to care about Americans. He's not a real president, and he never was. A real president doesn't ignore death threats to election officials or COVID records or the tens of millions of Americans in need just because he lost an election. The man sitting in the White House might not accept his loss, but he has abdicated his responsibilities, and his Republican enablers allowed him to. And it's the crux of a new piece from Susan Glasser in The New Yorker. The president is acting crazy, so why are we shrugging it off? Glasser argues that now is not the time to get complacent or to dismiss the president's insane behavior because far too much is at stake. Susan Glasser writes, quote, the temptation is to look away, to move on, to cringe and avert your gaze. That is exactly what Republicans in the Senate who have stood by Trump through impeachment and other ignominies have done this week, pivoting so seamlessly into bashing the new Biden administration that they never even stopped to acknowledge its existence. We can't look away. We can't allow the severe damage that's been done to be swept under the rug. Republicans, you are culpable. The man in the White House will ultimately demand diminish in importance. Your party will have to find an identity, maybe even one based on ideology rather than fealty to one flawed man. But for those of you Republicans who are hoping to rebuild and wash off the stench of Trump, you should know this. You will be remembered for your silence. You will be remembered for being complicit in one man's attempts to take down the country you profess to love. We do have just one president at a time. That's the design of our great democracy. In this case, America's real president just isn't in the Oval Office. Yet. Tried, judged, and convicted. Is there anyone else that has deconstructed the president's response to the COVID pandemic, the president's response to the economic crash, the GOP's complicity in what has happened to Americans, the deaths of Americans? The millions of maimed Americans, no one has had the courage to do that. This is the type of reporting that should be done, should have been done from March going forward. Do you think 74 million Americans would have voted for Donald Trump had they explicitly understood the complicity both of Donald Trump and the Republicans, do you think that Republicans would have picked up any House seats if they really understood where the genesis of the problem, the genesis of our economic disaster, what caused it? Not a chance. Great job by Ali Velci in the deconstruction of the complete dereliction of duty by both the president and his party the Republican Party. And you know what is interesting? Like I said, when you see me not put the blame of the on the ranking file Republicans, I'll, I'm going to show you a video now that is the exact reason why. When you have these guys, uh, when you have these guys that go out, I don't know, the stimulus check may, may still come. Uh, Bernie Sanders may be playing a game here to uh, force their hands, and there's a Republican apparently with him as well who wants to make sure that every American get that stimulus check? I mean, it's an economic necessity based on what's going on right now. But anyhow, um, 
like I tell you, my, my folks on the right, when they have sick offense like these, I want you to listen to this, and you can see, you know, this is what, these are the kinds of folks that have them so misled. Check this out. Earlier today on my show, I talked about, let's hold our rank and file American citizens, those on the right that somehow believe they're right wing sycophants or they're right wing enablers, they're right wing leaders. Uh, those are the ones that we should be holding accountable because you have a group of these guys that are so forceful in what they believe that they think they are right. I want you to listen to uh, this here with uh, Rick Santelli and good for, uh, 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 good for Andrew Sorkin who came back to really put him in his place. But check this out and then uh, we'll, we'll take it on the other side. This is simply and entirely pathetic. Check this out. Can't tell me that shutting down, which is the easiest answer, is necessarily the only answer. Rick, I just, I, I just as, a, as a as a public health and public service announcement uh, for the audience, the difference wait, between wait, a big all, box who retailer. Who is this? Hold on. The difference between <clears throat> the, oh, who else? the different who the else? difference between who a else? big box retailer. Hold on. The difference between a big box retailer and a restaurant or frankly, even a, a church, are so different, it's unbelievable. Going I disagree. Into a big box retailer, I disagree. You're wear, I disagree. You're wearing you can a mask. have your thoughts and I you're can have mine. You're required to wear a mask. I disagree. It's science. I'm sorry. It's science. If it's you're wearing a mask, science. it's a different story. 500 people in a Lowe's aren't any safer than 150 people in a restaurant that holds 600. I don't believe it. Sorry. Don't believe okay. it. And I you, live in an area don't... where there's a lot of restaurants that have fought back and they don't have any problems. And they're open. Okay. You don't have to believe it, but let me just say this. You're doing a I disservice to I the won't. viewer because the viewers need to you understand it. You are doing it. a disservice we, we are to the viewer. You are. You are. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, 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 I, I would like to keep our viewers as healthy as humanly possible. The idea of packing people into yeah. restaurants. I think our viewers are smart enough to make part of those Best decisions on their own. I don't things. think that I'm much smarter than all the viewers like some people do. Now, Sorkin is absolutely right. When you have people in a Lowe's, if you have 500 people in a Lowe's, a big place, and they're walking around and all wearing masks, they're not shedding the viruses as people in the pew of a church where they're sitting right next to each other in a small enclosed location with lower general ceilings. The same applies to restaurants. When you have people in these close proximities, they're more likely to get the virus. What these guys are doing is it's it's it should be considered voluntary manslaughter because they're messing with people's minds and they're causing people to do things that get them killed. And everywhere where these people take over, that is exactly what we see. And where we take measured approaches, where we take scientific approaches, that's where people do well. This uh, Santilli, has, as he's always been this Tea Party type guy, should be ashamed of himself, but we know they have no shame. We know they really don't care. We know they take care of themselves, but care nothing about anybody else. They just want people to pack these places so that in the churches, they can collect their collections. So that in restaurants, irrespective of what happens, oh, they'll make their buck. Shame on these guys. They have no humanity. And without further ado, welcome to Can't Tell Us Nothing improv. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today I have a different kind of a show. So you know, with, with us winning the, the races that we needed to win, I figure why not have a little bit of fun? We are here with Can't Tell Us Nothing. You can't yeah, tell yeah. these guys anything. I did it. I, I tried a little bit of grammar here now. We are here with one of the best improv shows in the country. Can't tell us nothing. Welcome aboard, guys. How are you guys doing today? Great. Thanks. Thank well, you. Doing awesome. awesome. Yeah. Well, let, let me tell you something now. I am not very apt in dealing with four people at the same time that have the same <laughs> level. So since you guys know each other, I'm going to say, please, please. Introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about 
your group. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are Can't Tell Us Nothing, an, uh, an improv group out of Houston, Texas. We've been together for, what, five years? Five years. Yeah. Forming in Houston and around the country. We've been to Los Angeles. We've been to New York. We've been to uh, Austin, Dallas, San Antonio. Uh, where, 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 where else? Where LA. Else? LA. Yeah. So my name is Antoine. Um, I've been doing improv for five, eight years. Yeah. Eight years now. And uh, yeah, these guys are some of the funniest people I've ever met. Um, yeah, my name is Amici. Um, I've been doing improv for, uh, is it six years now? Um, around six years. Uh, I know it's too much longer than John, so I was hoping he would go next. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know yeah. the exact time. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. Love and living in Houston. Well, from England. Before we finish, Amici, your mm -hmm. accent was different from that guy up top name, Antoine. Where is that from, man? Uh, I'm originally from England. I grew up in London. Uh, moved out to Texas when I was 16. So you see, folks, we even have an improv guy here in Houston from London. Um, well, I'm John Miles. Um, I'm the wild card of the group. Um, that doesn't mean anything special. It's just I'm typically the one that makes all the worst choices on stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, nonetheless, um, I, I believe um, it is seven years, Amici, okay. um, and it is, uh, he did start two months um, before I did. He was like one of the first people I met and, you know, we kind of grew up together in improv um, until we met Antoine and Tandy and they were, they were dope. And I'm going to pass it on to Tandy to tell her side. That's right. That's right. Bring it up the rear. I am Tandy. Well, my name is Tandaway Kone. I'm a native Houstonian. I have been doing improv for eight years. Antoine and I started out in the same class, so that's good. I don't have to keep up with the years he does. Um, uh, uh, love performing with these guys. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been an amazing ride. It's been an amazing ride with these fellows. They are some funny, funny individuals, creative hitting all the marks. I'm just glad to be along for the ride. Glad to be along for the ride. Should, should we explain what improv is? Do yeah, do that, do. Antoine. Please do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know. So, yeah. you know. Uh, so what we do is we do is a, a form of improv called long form improv comedy. And essentially it's taking what you've seen on like SNL or Mad TV or whatever sketch show you know of, Key and Pill, and we just make it up on the spot on stage or over this thing right here uh and and put it online as a podcast but yeah we make up scenes there's characters there's plot twists there's surprises it's a lot of fun but yeah that's pretty much it now i you know let me tell you folks that i i met these these guys at uh, <laughs> a, a, a function we had at kpft for the presidential elections and they uh, you know I, I told a little story and they turned that they turned that one story into several stories and they just had us laughing up the gazoo. And I, I finally begged them and say, hey, would you guys give me the honor of being on Politics Done Right? And I kind of put it on your Facebook page, right? And then I said, let's see what they're going to say. Yeah. Because they're going to say, we don't want to deal with no damn politics. And you know what? They said yes. So when they said yes, I said, you know what? Let's get busy. So anyhow, hey, Antoine, let me ask you something. Is this just, uh, is this a side gig, a full-time gig? Do you guys have jobs? How do you do all of this stuff? It's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, it is at the moment like a very side is growing. Like we have been approached by multiple people to collaborate, to help build, to, to grow our brand and help their theaters or help what they're trying to do. So right now we, I think we all have day jobs, but we are very excited to see where this can go and where it can take us. And what's your expectation, John? Um, my expectation, you know, I'm very ambitious. I want to build, um, there's a, there's a, there's a place called second city that's in Chicago. It's like the foundation, um, or the capital of where improv and comedy is. And I actually believe we can have that in Texas. And, you know, my, my sites are on building that kind of infrastructure here. And I know it's going to take time and we still got a whole lot of stuff to do, but that, that's where I see it going. Is that where your, your group would be sort of the lead group to bring a lot of other uh, acts like that on? Or is that what we're talking about? 
Yes, and uh, there's there's a lot of uh, play. Like Austin is doing a decent job at you know stretching and, and finding other ways to kind of spread the art form into other places. I just think you know it's kind of how we got together. Well, there there's a there's a whole lot of folklore on how we got together. But one of the principles where we all were performing and learning this art form and naturally looking for a way to you know, uh, uh, someone that you can identify with that can kind of teach you maybe even more connected, right? And um, we didn't really have that in a group. So we formed a group. And one of the things was going around and performing and getting other people that looked like us or identify with us or our culture or, or diversified in culture and, and in comedy. So um, that's kind of a little bit of a mission that we we do, I, I think it's it's embedded in just the work we do. Uh, I don't think we like have a an, a, an actual goal uh, like that we're trying to chip away at. But I think in the DNA, we we recognize when we go out and perform that there could be someone like us that may say, "Hey, I've never seen this. I want to learn it," which will grow the community and and hopefully inspire other artists. Absolutely. Now, Tandy, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hate to make the first question that I'm asking you directly having to do with gender, but I, I, I figure since I'm seeing four guys on the screen and one woman, I better do that because some really? other people would say, why is Tandy the only woman right there? So <laughs> I'm going to leave that up to you to answer however best to answer. Well, um, I think uh, I'll answer the first part of your question, which is how, why is Tandy the only woman here with these uh, three guys? And uh, when we formed the group, uh, I think uh, the person, I'm not going to name who formed it, but the person who uh, set out to get us together said, I want to pick some of the, uh, the best improvisers, uh, Black improvisers in our theater, and let's just get together and form a group. Uh, I think at the time I was, um, I think the only woman improviser who had gone through, black woman improviser who had gone through all of the classes. And so um, I happened to be good, pat myself on the back. Uh, Actually, and, you're very and, good. <laughs> and, um, and so they, they, you know, when the idea was introduced to me, I was like, yes, absolutely fantastic. Of course I'll join. Because, um, uh, you know, we, John said it and we don't, you know, we don't necessarily dance around it, or at least I want, I won't. But when you look at improv groups uh, throughout the United States, typically you'll find that they're white male dominated. Mm -hmm. So to see an improv group, first of all black people, and then, you know, to have uh, a black woman in that group is not, is not a usual thing. It's, it's, it's uh, rare. We don't want it to be rare. We want more people to know what improv is, more black people to know what improv is because all black people know about stand up, but we want them to know uh, improv, that improv has led to a lot of the great comedic actors that you know uh, and that you see on television and in movies. And we just want to expose it there. And just being a woman, it's, you know, again, it's also a very male dominated uh, art form. So it's possible to have a group with four black men, you know, that that is possible. But um, I'm just so, you know, honored that uh, they extended the, the, uh, the invitation to me. You know, I, I just got schooled because I was about, my next question after hearing this mm -hmm. was going to be about, uh, look, we have a lot of these Black comedians from Richard Pryor and all of that, not realizing that, yeah, you have a lot of stand-up, but mm -hmm. not improv. So I, I didn't quite, even as I'm speaking to you guys, and even I've, I've done this several times, I hadn't made the distinction between the, the, the several acts, the, the, you know, the several type of, would you call it, is it okay to call it a comedic act or, yeah. or yeah, like, like, so. like a comedic act. Now, um, Amici, uh, mm -hmm. come in, you know, uh, there, there are five of us on this thing here. Two of us actually came from somewhere else. <laughs> OK, now let me ask you, how was your uh, integration into the group? Uh, I mean, what a lot of people don't realize, right, is being black is one thing, right? But all black ain't the same. <laughs> so there are different experiences that you have that I know you have that is quite different than, let's say, Antoine and John and Tandy. So uh, how did that mix come and What kind of flavor did you bring to the group? that kind of expanded its role or expanded uh, the, 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 the kind of comedy that you guys were able to provide? Hear this, yeah. yeah. Well, um, 
<laughs> it was very hard at first. Um, I'm just kidding. But no, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to no, say, um, yeah, and uh, I think um, this is this, this is one of the things where um, being different helps. Uh-huh. It's good to have. Uh, uh, you know, we're four people, but we're from different places. We have different experiences, um, and um, I, I think that helps our improv because we have we bring different ideas together um, in in fun ways in ways that people wouldn't normally expect. Um, yeah, you know, because I, I, you know, grew up in England. I lived for you in Nigeria. Um, you know, I lived in Texas. I lived in Alabama. Uh, I was an athlete. I've, I've had a lot of different things. Um, you know, lots of different kind of experiences come together. Um, John says some of the same things. Antoine says some of the same things. Tanya has some of the same things. Um, so there's things that we we connect. But then you know, we also throw in a bunch of different ingredients that um, you know we, we don't know about. So we can even educate each other in things, and we can uh, discuss things in, in new and fun, different ways. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it was definitely a benefit. I, I think that we're, we're, you know, we're not four siblings who all grew up in the same mm-hmm. house and mm-hmm. um, all went to the same school and all, all, all the same things. You know, we all and we, we all bring something different to the table, which I think is uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, and I, I can I can attest to that having uh, been it. So let me see if this is something that I am I can actually ask. Uh, Donald Trump has uh, lost his mind, and he thinks <laughs> that he can still win the election. You guys are improv. Does improv work where somebody say, can you do an improv on that? All right, I got an idea. I got an idea. <clears throat> hey, y'all. Yeah, what's up? What's, what's going uh, on? Hey. Normally, I got a bunch of ideas. Yeah. You know, I always have ideas. You oh, yeah. Ideas right. You know. All the time. All the time, man. Too but, many. Um, I'm kind of stuck, man. I, 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 I'm feeling like my idea factory is not working right now. The idea factory is yeah. clogged. Got the machinery's down. Yeah, man. I mean, it's been like you know, I've been writing jokes in the you know in the room all day, and you know, I just feel like every Donald Trump joke has been done. I think yeah, like yeah. I think he beats us to the punch, man. I just can't. Yo, we're we're about to go on Egberto's show. You, yeah. you, we need you there with the Donald Trump jokes, man. I mean, <sighs> I mean, the factory started again, man. Why, why, did, y'all, why did y'all promise 50 jokes? Why did y'all say 50? You'll get 50 Donald Trump jokes. Why did John, you promise him that? John, you did 75 Biden jokes, and we didn't even ask you to. So, I mean, 50 on Trump, that's that's nothing, man. You can do this. Can I come clean with y'all? Of course. course. Yeah, I mean, of course. About 63 of those was from Trevor Noah's show. No. You no, John. John. You've been John. John. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You told us not to I, watch him anymore. Listen, I didn't think anybody still watched him when he was growing his hair out and stuff. I just I just figured it. I mean, no one's they're just wasted jokes. Let me just transform them into this platform. But everybody has a Donald Trump joke. You're saying if we took a joke that came out of the, the John Idea Factory and took the label off, we'd find a Trevor Noah label on it? Is that what you're telling us right now? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Oh, wow. Oh. I know, and, but listen, yeah, I, Egberto loved them, though. He loved them. That's what got us here. Yeah, I wouldn't John have stole was. those jokes. We wouldn't have been on Egberto's show. John, we gave you an award. Like the funny, funniest, um, funniest Trump joke of the week award, several yeah. times. The the Donald Trump Award. The Donald yeah. Trump Award. We the named Donald it after you. Trump <laughs> award. We took up a collection, John. I I I took some of the money from my rent to put in that collection. Cause I I thought you deserved it, man. I thought you. Yeah, oh, I was geez. seeing it as like a like a stimulus package for the Idea Factory. You know. Listen, I, I appreciate all of that. You know, those awards are hanging up in my in my room that I was trying to write jokes from. But um, to be fair, it did take a couple of hours to sit through all of those Trevor Noah jokes. I mean, there's a lot of bad jokes. Oh, I'm so- sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Wait, wait, hold, hold on. on. You want credit? You want credit for the time you spent stealing jokes? I mean, there is labor, right? I, I mean, it's part of jokes. You were watching TV. Labor. That's not labor. That's junk. <laughs> you no, know, it is labor. I had, to, I had to rewrite what I thought he was trying to say in a joke. Listen. I'm, all I'm saying is like, all the artists steal. There's just nothing I can steal Donald Trump. Everything has been stolen. There's no more Donald Trump jokes, all right? But I can get a couple more 
you know, Joe Biden's out there. I still see that they're doing them. Nobody you know? wants that. Man. John. Hey, Egberto loves Joe Biden. You can't joke with Egberto. Listen, I'm a comedian, okay? <laughs> I can joke about whatever I want. All right? As whatever. Y'all know what does it first, huh? <laughs> and scene. <laughs> that's, wow. that's a little bit of what we do. And it, yeah, it's yeah, funny yeah. because <laughs> they, they come up with this stuff. You just ask and it happens. And that is not easy. I can tell you that is not. <laughs> Do it, I can tell you something. Doing politics is a lot easier because you're dealing with stuff that's already there. You know, that that was great, guy. But you know, uh, seriously, uh, get getting on a little serious uh, topic here. You know, uh, before we actually started talking, I was talking to John, and you know, uh, we were talking about whether how much politics we we're going to talk about, and and we decided that we weren't going to talk a whole lot of politics, right? But then uh, Jonathan told me a little bit of his story, and. We take this stuff very seriously. Uh, you know, we at Politics and Right are proponents of Medicare for All because people really need it. It is very mm -hmm. important, that particular issue of everybody having health insurance. And what we're doing in the United States right now, we call pretty much antiseptic murder. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your story, Jonathan, that uh, we discussed earlier with you and your, your wife and what went, what went on? Absolutely. So um, this year, in the midst of COVID-19, um, in June, my, my wife was diagnosed with stage three inductal uh, carcinoma, invasive inductal carcinoma. She'll kill me for messing that up. I'm sorry, y'all. But nonetheless, uh, she was diagnosed with it. And uh, my wife just turned 30 in January. Uh, we had had a 11th month old baby that she was still breastfeeding um, at the time. And if it wasn't for breastfeeding, we probably wouldn't have found the tumor. So um, <clears throat> of course, like anybody who gets that information and also as young as we are, we were terrified. And um, part of my background was in finance. So not only thinking about the mortality side, I also thought about the financial um, side as well. And that also looked terrifying. Uh, my wife, had her care, her care done at MD Anderson. And also um, there was no way that they would let me into the hospital. So the whole time she's done her treatment, her surgeries, anything, she's had to do that by herself. And um, so that was also challenging. Um, one of the ways that we were able to keep up with the financial uh, bills uh, since we didn't, we didn't, let's say, we didn't qualify for any type of financial assistance. You know, um, none, there was just none available to us. And it wasn't from our caseworker told us, it wasn't even worth looking or applying. Um, so we decided to go to GoFundMe. We designed buttons, my wife designed Jack hoodies. And she, even in the midst of going through chemo treatment was out there connecting with people online, sharing her story and people were donating on in, in exchange of those items. Um, November 18th, um, my wife had had her double mastectomy, which was the first time that we knew that the cancer cells weren't in her body. And as of, la as of Monday of this week, she was uh, given a report that she was totally cancer free. They didn't find one, mm -hmm. one micro cell in any of her tissue and what they removed. So the gorilla pounds that was on our shoulder just left. And, um, and I'll tell you what, her, pers her perseverance and her, her, her willingness to live and to connect and to, to reach out to people potentially helped save a just tremendous like avalanche of other problems that we had. Um, and the, of course, MD Anderson is not cheap. So just seeing the bills roll in, you know, was enough to faint, you know, like there, yeah, I think one of our treat, one of her, there was like a needle that we had, she had to use to inject steroid after a treatment that I believe was um $18,000, $18,000, man, just to have this patch. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it was, it, it, and, it, and when you're, when you're fighting or wanting your family member to fight for their life, your significant other, you know, there's not enough money that you could, somebody could show you that would make you go, man, no, you know, 
So you got to take what you can get because you got to keep her going. You got to keep her living, you know, but there wasn't one day and some of the worst days, emotional ways I had was thinking about what are we going to do with this big financial burden that's just growing week after week after week after week. And, you know, like I say, shout out to everybody that helped any way. We had people sending us dinners. We had people just chipping in any way. And, and of course, um, we were able to go and hit that out of pocket max quickly with the support of our friends and family to protect us because a lot of that money was going to go to our children going to school. So um, that was my journey. Um, my group, shout out to them every week. They let me do this podcast with them every week. And that was sometimes that was only the, the only hour or two that I actually laughed in a day or two, right? Um, because of how much worrying or how much stress that I was under. But um, even the days that I'll suck on the podcast, <laughs> it still gave me, a, it gave me something to live for, you know? Um, and um, so I appreciate them for that. But that's, that's been my story in a nutshell. Let me tell you, John, uh, I believe stories are some of the best way to communicate and actually effect change. And I think on, uh, the, the thing about it is in America, we know how to suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the worst things that's out there. And the, when one shares stories, when people are able to hear each other's stories, they realize, first of all, that they're not alone. But secondly, that your story today can be my story tomorrow. And once we understand that we can start from a political standpoint, we can start talking about policies that help everybody without somebody think, well, it's only he's going to benefit from that, as opposed to just maybe if I am in your position, I would be able to benefit as a person who has a wife with lupus with that kind of those kinds of expenses. I understand your pain. And it's interesting because earlier on, we also spoke to Amici, who is originally from England and understands that they don't they don't have that problem that we have at all. Nobody is going to go bankrupt from uh, or, or lose uh, their, their, their income from that. So I uh, thank you for telling the story and, I, and thanks for having this little interlude where we could get some, a, a, a little bit of our politics in there. Oh, yeah. And I'm so happy that your wife is, uh, is doing, doing much better. So going, going forward and, 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 and kind of cheering it up a, a little bit more, I, I just want to thank you guys, right? For who you are and for what you do and ask you to tell the audience here, whether here in Houston or elsewhere, how can they really be a part of all that fun that you guys have to offer? Sure, I can, I can mention a few things. Uh, so if you <laughs> want to find out more about what we do, if you want to see our show, if you want to reach out and connect, have a question, think you'd be a great guest, find us CTUN Improv is what you want to Google CTUN Improv on Facebook. It's probably your best bet. Uh, but we're also on YouTube. We're also on Instagram. We're, we also have our own website, ctunimprov.com. So check it out on all, on all those platforms. And uh, yeah, let us know what you think. Reach out, say hi. Please tell me something you wish I had asked you personally. So let's go ahead and start with Tandy. What <laughs> did you wish I would have asked you? I, I wish you would have asked me Tandy, what made you get into improv? Why would you? Why did you gravitate to this? So answer it. <laughs> no, you know. Okay. <laughs> hey, look. Um, I needed. I neglected the arts um, in my life after uh, I graduated from high school and went to college. I just stopped doing artistic things. And, um, you know, focused on other things. And then when the other things got overwhelming, I realized I needed an outlet. So I, um, uh, I'm a nurse and um, I noticed that humor helped me get through the day, through some of the pressures and the rigors of, of uh, that profession. And I used to say my patients were my, my, uh, my patients' rooms were my stage. I'd open up the door and I'd step on stage. So when I, um, uh, you know, when I realized, yeah, I kind of do need this outlet, I uh, found improv comedy as opposed to stand up because I was, in addition to being a, a nurse, I was a wife. 
I had a small child and a baby. And, you know, if you do stand up, you out late, you know, two and three in the morning by the time if you're new, by the time you get on a, um, an open mic set. And so um, my ex husband now wasn't having it at the time. So I was like, I got to find something else to do uh, that can uh, let me be funny, but be home by 10. And so I found, I found, or okay, 11, 12 latest, I found improv, found improv comedy. Thank you, uh, Tandy. Amici. <laughs> what? What was I, was what I was so engaged in her story. Um, I, I think you're such a great interview. You, you, you know exactly what you're doing. Good cop out, but it's okay. I'm gonna let you slide this time, Amici. John. Great. Um, I got a good one. It was, how do you learn improv? It was a question I would have liked you to ask me. And the reason I, ask, I say that is because whenever I get into a deep conversation about what we do, it usually always pops up because what, what it looks like we're doing is just coming up with random thoughts and things, you know? Um, but in essence, there is a framework, which is why improv became an art form. You know, and you learn that framework and you build on those skills, which are being able to listen, you know, and listen to what somebody is actually saying and inferring in the subtext, um, learning how to accept somebody's idea and, and, and make it um, also your idea and make it better by adding something to it and not taking something from it as another framework that we do. Um, the other thing they learned, that we learned is um, empathizing through that process, because if you have to accept somebody's idea, you learn how to just empathize with where they come from, because you have to in order to make this, this, this gumbo work. Um, and <clears throat> and the, finally, it, it, just, it just teaches you a, a, a level of just confidence. If you know how to listen when people are speaking to you, and you know how to respond by connecting with somebody, it just makes you a, to me, a wetter, a, a more well-rounded person when it comes to having relationships with people. Um, everybody in my group, our, as our improv career has bloomed, our friendships have as well. And it's because of the same things that we just described are all things that we do in our relationships. We listen to each other, we share ideas, we work on each other's ideas to make each other look good. Um, and then, the other principle is following the fear. Uh, that's a, something you were hearing in improv. Following fear leads you to dismiss your own, you know, insecurities about something you don't want to do. Um, and part of what we do is letting go of what we can't control to create something better. Beautiful. Antoine, bring us home. Sure, I'll keep mine short and sweet. I wish you would have asked me if I'm really from Houston because yes, I am born and raised. For some reason, people hear how I speak, they don't think that I'm from Houston. They think I'm from somewhere else, but I am. I was raised in a leaf Houston, Texas. The SWAT, as some people might know, Southwest or Southwest, as some other people might say. But that's uh, <laughs> just so people know Houston, Texas here. H town. <laughs> can't tell us nothing look guys it was my honor to have all four of you on politics done right uh first of all i want to thank you for the fun that i had with you guys at the presidential show that we had at kpft and i want to thank you for giving me the opportunity and giving my audience the opportunity to learn a little bit about you guys all the information about you, we are going to put in a blog post, a standalone blog post as well, because again, I think uh, you guys, you guys are just great. We, well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that off kind of a subject thing, not, not usual here. Yeah, Antoine is, is, is I mean, uh, John Miles is pretty deep. Uh, no accent at all, Antoine. Yeah, I know what you mean. You can't really figure out where he's from. Um, my thoughts, my, my thoughts with your sister... Uh, Michael Radnin, my thoughts are with your sister. Uh, we all go through a whole lot of these things. As you guys know, I haven't been shy about it with my daughter and my wife having lupus. My daughter just haven't had a stroke. Uh, medical issues are something that affects us all. And that is one of the reasons we really need to have true, a true healthcare system instead of a healthcare system who uses sickness 
to transfer the wealth of the masses to a few. If we can just be able to, con to tell folks exactly, oh, I'm sorry, your sister, uh, Bridge, I'm sorry, your sister. It's Bridge's sister. I'm so sorry uh, for, for that. Bridge's sister, who's uh, going through the, the, the issues. But um, again, go go going back to healthcare, one of the things that I think we have to be able to tell everybody is that the current healthcare system in America is not a system to help you. It's not a system to cure you. It's a system to transfer. It's a system to transfer your wealth to a distinct few. And when we are able to tell truthfully that that is how our system is designed, that is when we will be able to convince others that we can do better. Welcome aboard, Bridge MCP, Michael Rudnan, uh, Tank28, uh, Paul Fleming. And Paul, uh, yes, I uh, suffering in silence with MS, another autoimmune disease. Uh, brother, you know I'm with you. I'm telling you something, Paul. Uh, yeah, I know you have your good days and your bad days. That's just the, the nature of that particular illness. Uh, hang in there. Know that you're not alone. You have people with you, brother. You have people with you. Um, uh, Daniel Ledo, welcome aboard. Uh, let's see. Lee Grant, welcome aboard. Lee, it's not always funny to everybody. Some, it's funny to some. It's, I, I, I love them. And a lot of people in Houston love them. A lot of people around the country love them. They won quite a few awards. And again, you know, comedy is one of those things. It's, a, it's all distinct for different uh, people, what kind they like, how they like it, when they like it, etc. So that's what it is. Now, I, I noticed that Tank has been concerned about the amount of people that are watching us live. Again, Brother Tank, just let me tell you that we have thousands of people. They watch on podcasts, live and otherwise. Most of our views come on podcasts through all the different podcasting networks. I'd love to have a whole lot of people watching live. We don't have uh, the best time slot. People work. People do a whole lot of things at 3 o'clock. I've asked people if they wanted to change the hours, but I have a strategic problem. I love my people that I've been talking to here at 3 o'clock for a very long time. And uh, so I, I, I run the risk of, you know, I, I want to stay at three for several reasons, and we, we do a rerun of the show. Uh, again, it's on podcasts and everywhere else. So as far as the numbers are concerned, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. We're doing just fine. We're making our difference, and everybody here, everybody who watches live and otherwise, they are making a difference. They are making a difference. So... um. Paul, I had promised to send your book out on, I think it was Friday. I wasn't able to. All kind of stuff happened. It happened. It goes out for you today. I ask your forgiveness. And I'm glad that uh, Bridge got her T-shirt, all that good stuff. Um, anyhow, uh, let's go ahead and say, please, that book on the screen, it's worth it. I ask you so kindly to, if you have the wherewithal, Go ahead and get the book. It's it's a worthwhile read. You can get it at that Amazon link that I just placed in there. But of course, you can also get it at our store to cut out the middle person. Just like Paul did it at our store to cut out the middle person. So thank you so kindly, guys. Uh, go to politicsandright.com slash store. Alternatively, you can support our program by going to politicsandright.com slash Patreon. You can also go to politicsandright.com slash PayPal. But if you are on YouTube, you can just click that Join button and say, I want to support Politics Done Right because we know you're doing the work that we all have to get done. So please consider as well going to politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube if you're not on YouTube already and hit that Join button. Again, that is politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube. If you're already on YouTube, just click the Join button and become a part of our posse. As Bridge MCP would call it, the PDR Posse. Is that right, Bridge? PDR Posse? I think that's what you call it, Bridge. PDR Posse. Anyhow, folks, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and again, those of you that are going through issues with illness or whatever, know that, know this, because it, you know, um, when we're sick, when we're going through things, a lot of times we think 
that we're going through these things alone, you know? Anytime I have to pick up my daughter on, you know, her mood, because my, my daughter is a strong young lady. I mean, a 28-year-old at the time when she got the stroke and how she came back and she fought to finish, you know, finish that year in, in, in uh, her third year in med school, now in her fourth year, I couldn't help but gain another level of respect for her because she's going through all this stuff as she is sick and watching her. And there are times I know she has got to be down. I know she has got to be down sometimes because a, a, a 29-year-old that can barely move her left side, right? Thank you very much, Bridge. Can barely move her left side. And she's there. You know what she told me? She said, Daddy, I can't wait to come home this Christmas because you and I, we are going to do PT together. Uh, what PT stands for? Training. Uh, what you call it? Training. We're going to go through and work her left side and we're going to go walking and we're going to be exercising her hands because when I was there in D.C., that's what we did to kind of help her flexibility to bring it all back. So my message to you, Paul, I know what you go through with MS, brother. I really, really do. Both from having a wife with lupus and having a daughter who's just had the stroke. I know what you're going through. And for all of those, physical therapy, thank you. And for all of those that are going through issues, we all have some kind of, well, most, a lot of us have issues, some kind of illness or whatever. Like I said, in America, we like to suffer, or many people in America just think they have to suffer alone. This is not a psychological program today, but it's just something that I felt I needed to say. Let's stop suffering alone. You know, tell, tell your story. Hell, if you have something that you think others are going through and just knowing that you are going through it can help somebody, just like, just, just like John did on the program, right? John Miles. I, he started, when we started to record the program, he started to tell me about his wife. And I said, hey, a lot of people would love to hear that. Would you tell the story to the audience? And he thought a little bit and he said, yeah. And then that's when we got into the part about suffering in silence and that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, tell the story. Why? You know, we have a tendency, oh, we don't want to tell that this is happening or whatever. No, you help others when others know that we are all in this game together. We all go through the same things at some point in time. That is why we need Medicare for all. Not for when 90% of people are healthy, but for the few times when 10% of people just happen to need it. Let's start thinking about other people. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. Love you guys. Thank you guys for being here. You know how I get out of here. I am what? Out! We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.